Yeah. 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 Well, we were uh, up on the Blue Ridge Parkway there, and they had a, um, a, a cultural museum. It was in, I believe it was in the Virginia part. And they were showing the, the Great Wagon Trail, which led out of the immigrants would come, the German and the Irish and the Scots would come into Philadelphia, and then they would come down the Appalachian Trail, basically. And there was a wagon trail. And then there was two, basically there was a fork in the road. Uh, if you went left, you went south down through the Carolinas into Georgia. And if you went, um, if you went left and if you went right, you went into Tennessee and Kentucky and points west. And my relatives all went, you know, down to the Carolinas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But one guy said, he said that basically doing the calculations that 25% of all Americans can, uh, can trace their ancestors back to coming down that road. Oh, you know? really? Yeah, there were that many people that came down, you know. Hmm. Well, yeah. See, that's a significant piece of history. It should be in books more than it is. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I sort of knew it, but, you know, to see it on a, a, I think I actually took a video of the map. It was interesting to see it, you know. Mm -hmm. Two forks in the road, you know. And you, you went one way, you went south, you know, into the Carolinas. Was that fork in uh, Maryland, or? Uh, I think it was in Virginia. Oh, somewhere, in current day, current Virginia, yeah, but that was back in the 1840s, 30s and 40s, when there was this huge migration because they were basically looking to bring in anybody that would go settle. And so there were, uh, you know, my ancestors came from there. That's where they came from. They were Germans, and so the situation there was is if you were a poor dirt farmer, you had no chance of buying land or moving up. You, know, you certainly couldn't go to the university or whatnot, and so... Why not? You go to a strange country, you don't speak English, but you can learn it. And, you know, after a generation, the, the old language is lost anyway. Everybody would learn English. And then they, uh, because my relatives then were Southerners and they fought in the Civil War. They were in the South. Mm -hmm. you know, they were Southern Confederate, you know, the ones that I know of. Um, and there was, there was you know, I, I, my, my guess was after one or two generations, there was no tie whatsoever to Germany you know that was all past you know. but that was in the 18 and so I guess and they were all farmers looking for land and wherever they could get free land or land that was you know, incredibly dirt cheap that's where they settled and some didn't find it they just kept going and they kept going and they went all the way to California you know eventually you know you just kept looking for it till you found it but that's what they did and so they weren't city people you know, they were farmers yeah, and uh, besides the Germans, there was uh, the, they called them Scotch Irish. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> they were responsible for what we call country music. Now, apparently, if yeah. You well, that's that. the 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 interesting thing about the mountain music, which is why we were kind of you know we like it, and you could see the banjo came from Africa, right? And the fiddle came from Germany, uh, Ireland, England, mm -hmm. and Scotland, right? And so the two came together, and you had the banjo and the fiddle, and that became the mountain music, and that was what people, because they were so remote. What I thought was interesting is that, one of the other interesting things I remember was that the areas, and some of those areas were fairly populated, because they could get the free land. And, you know, basically if you could settle and, you know, make a go of it, you could keep it. In the early, and so they would be, you know, you'd see the landmarks there in the Blue Ridge Parkway that was saying, you know, if you... They find cabins, you know, if you hike back out, you can find remains of cabins and buildings, you know, where the people would settle. Now nobody was there because the winters are pretty tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the winters are snowy. You know, it's heavy snow. Uh, they closed down the parkway, I think, November 1st. Cause it's snow and ice. But, today. yeah, it would be today. It would be closed, you know. Today's November 1st. Right, right, right. So it would be closed, you know. Um... Let's but see if they had that covered and, bridge and, there. And life was, you know, we <laughs> listened to this guy talk about how they would do a wooden chair. And, you know, finding the trees on the certain side of the slopes. And, the, you know, you'd want to get a tree that wasn't twisted. The bark wasn't twisted. And they would strip it. And then they would, they would how they would make the, the legs and the back. And then the seat would be, like, woven with strips of wood. And it had to be certain kind of, you know, like, take a long time. But the other interesting thing was, is, is time was a different commodity because he said you would put your order in with the chair maker and it might be next year before you got it or three or four months. It wasn't like you, you know, expect it next week. Or you go down to Walmart, you want a chair, you go down and buy it, right? Mm -hmm. 
that wasn't it. So time was a different commodity. Then. And they got together uh, on the weekends. That's where they played the music. There was obviously no radio, at least initially. Then in the 30s, I guess the radio became much more prevalent. Maybe the late 20s, somewhere in there, the radio, and, and then eventually the TVs, and it sort of changed. But originally it was a community type thing. And they played the fiddle and the banjo. Interesting, you know, how that. But the other thing that we noticed, that I noticed was, is that in those festivals there were very few young people. You know, it's, it's a passing, you know, we're talking about culture mm -hmm. going. And I thought forever. Probably that, TV is responsible for that. Uh, TV right. and yeah. newer music. But mm -hmm. some of the younger people are learning it, but obviously the better ones are the older people. Mm -hmm. But the audience you look at, they're all older people. You know, it's not a, it's not a younger person's thing. You know, the kids are the ones that played it. Even you know, they're not maybe the country music or rock and roll or rap. I don't know what, but it's a. You can see the cultural shift in in time there. You know, it's it's dying. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Eventually, there'll only be videos like mine. You know, mm -hmm. Laurel Bloomery, you know, Bill Hirschfeld. From Roan Mountain and TV Barnett from Roan Mountain, North Carolina. And those guys are got to be in their late 70s. Have you ever heard of a guy named Alan Lomax? Alan Lomax. Name, you know, the name sounds familiar. He was a guy that back in the 30s that went around and recorded mm -hmm. music that yeah. was going to die. It was in danger of dying out. Right, and right. And, uh, he's the one that recorded Lead Belly. I think he discovered Lead Belly. Uh -huh. People like that, but also other people, you know, yeah. mountain music included. Well, there's some that carried on, but <laughs> you can see where it's, it's, you know, I mean, at Laurel Bloomery, which is the oldest fiddle convention in the Appalachian Blue Ridge, there was maybe, you know, Friday night, maybe 100 people in the audience, and Saturday night, maybe 150, tops 200. I don't think it probably got to 200 people, you know. So where is that exactly? This was in Tennessee. It's right on the border between Tennessee, Virginia, and North okay. Carolina. Yeah. Okay. And it's a, a you know, real pretty setting along a river in an old mill. It's a park. And um, we heard about it from another convention. We were, filled a convention. We were in it, Freeze, Virginia. Freeze is, in, uh, is about, I don't know, 80 miles away or something like that. from F-R-E-E-Z. F-R-I-E-S. Yeah. Yeah. And it's along a river. Yeah, that'd be a German and, name. And they uh, had, Freeze was famous because it had uh, mills there, textile mills, and they hired, hired child labor. And some of those, they had pictures actually up in the, in the museum on the parkway of some of the kids that were in the factory. They didn't have shoes. I mean, you look at some of the kids, they didn't have shoes. And they, they would point out certain ones. So-and-so went on to become a famous fiddle player. And so you know, it was like a... That was like the popular music then. They didn't have rock and roll. And that was what the kids kids did because that was what the music that they had back in the 20s, I guess, or the 30s, you know, 40s. But it was famous. It was known for its child labor. And, you know, the kids were like eight years old, some of them working in the, the mills there, you know. You know just, I mean, that was, that was it. But Laurel Bloomery, and there was there's a few of the older guys that are good still, like Bill Hertzfield and T.V. Barnett, but they're getting older. I mean, they're getting, you know, they're in their 80s, or, you know, they're getting older. But it's a dying, dying musical form. Uh, even bluegrass, it appears that bluegrass has kind of peaked, and it's declining, too, you know. So I could see 50 or 100 years, there would be no, no bluegrass musicians or no mountain music mm. fiddlers, you know. Mm. You know, there may be some banjo players, but, you know, the... The other interesting thing was um, 